We're really excited to have you here today. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Can you share with me your name and your background? Uh, my name is Chris Smith. I'm an MD. I'm a neurosurgeon at the Barrow Neurolog Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona. Remarkable. And so through your career and as a father, what, what are you noticing in the kinds of neurosurgery that you're doing now versus when you started? And, and how do you see diet impacting the health of our brains? So there's always this debate, you know, the tumor progression is terrible, right. but consequences of our treatment is, is also just as bad. So I have many patients, and I gave examples of this yesterday, of people that have survived, but they're, they're really not living. And so when I learned about the ketogenic diet, I learned about two really important things. Number one is it's an anti-inflammatory diet, and, mm -hmm. and number two, so that can help decrease the swelling in the brain and help decrease the need for a corticosteroid. But it helps starve the cancer, so the, the cancer cells really aren't adapted to be able to use ketones, where our brain functions very well on ketones, in fact, in fact better on ketones than it does on glucose. So, so I've been converted personally to the ketogenic oh, diet. you have? When did yeah, you convert? About six months ago, honestly, because wow. I was prescribing it for three different things for my patients. I, have, I treat epilepsy and brain tumors, so mm -hmm. people with chronic epilepsy, you, ketogenic diet's been known for over 20 years to help decrease right. seizures. And I understand, you understand that from your son. And, um, and also for patients that are obese and have a condition called pseudotumor, cerebri, they have, they're usually very obese young women and they, because of the increased weight, it causes weight to be on their heart and pressure in their veins to be elevated, which means pressure in their spinal fluid that has to get absorbed in the veins is even more elevated. So they have headaches and they go blind. And so I've been prescribing the ketogenic diet for them. And if they go, if they're on it, they'll la gradually lose weight in a very healthy way. They'll decrease their headaches, they'll get their vision back, wow. and I can take out the shunt that I had to put yeah. in to treat their, their pseudotumor. And then the third thing uh, is patients with brain tumors. So as I was prescribing this more and more, I really was hearing how hard it was and, and difficult to, to maintain. And so I really wanted a personal experience. Like how, if I do this, how difficult is it? What are, the, what are the roadblocks? What are the things that make people not able to be on this diet? And so I've learned a lot. And what I've learned... Yeah, I'm so interested <laughs> to hear what the roadblocks are from so, your experience. So a lot of times, I think uh, when, when people prescribe a diet as a therapy, they overstate that you have to measure everything and count right. every calorie and count every gram of carbohydrates and, and make it very unappealing, right? Yes. Whereas the ketogenic diet is a wonderful diet. It's flavorful. All of your fats are what give your your foods the flavors that we love, the butters and the creams and the cheeses. Mm -hmm. And what's better than that, yeah. right? Don't you feel yeah. like you're cheating every day, but, yes. but you're actually not? That's that's no. what happens to me. Right. And you don't, and you're not counting calories. Right. You're actually enjoying your food. And it's very flavorful. And uh, grass-fed butter in my coffee every morning. And I use the MCT oils. And I do this. And I find, so I'm an athletic guy. I'm a marathon runner. And, and I found that I am doing better than ever on the ketogenic diet. You actually sure. convert your body to being more efficient. You use about 20% less oxygen for the same amount of work on a ketogenic wow. diet. So I'm getting better times That's on all of my all of my races than I've ever done. Twenty percent less oxygen. Yes, for the same amount of energy output. Incredible. So, yeah. so what are the roadblocks? Well, I think the roadblocks is are mostly just a lack of. Um, um, variety. So people think they're stuck to eating just the same thing every day. And it turns out there are some very creative nutritionists and chefs that have made wonderful um, variations of food with the ketogenic diet. It turns out there are ketogenic breads and you can make them with uh, almond meal and coconut meal and put tons of butter on them and they taste fantastic. You can make ketogenic pancakes and you can make all kinds of things that are, you know, just uh, different. And, and I used to think it wasn't going out to dinner unless you had a really good chocolate dessert at the end. So instead, now we make what are called chocolate almond butter fat bombs. Yeah. And we eat those. They're wonderful. You put yes. macadamia nuts in them or almonds or peanuts and things that in the chocolate mm -hmm. uh, with butter and coconut oil, and, and they're, they're wonderful. And how many of your patients do you put on, on a ketogenic diet? So I talk to, you know, my, my office staff is probably sick of me hearing, you know, hearing me talk about it because I talk about it with almost so every great. patient. Yeah. 
Um, but the but some patients, like I said, the pseudo tumor patients, the brain tumor patients, epilepsy patients, all of them get a handout, and uh, and if they really go formally on a study that we're doing for brain tumors, they get a, a keto meter, and they get a dietitian, and they get a whole en enrollment in the program. So, wow. so I have about ten patients actively right now on the ketogenic diet for brain tumor management. The radiation treatment causes swelling and inflammation. The ketogenic diet's anti-inflammatory, so we're actually seeing a decrease in brain swelling mm. without corticosteroids and with an improved quality of life and improved cognition and memory function and all yes. those things. And so if you, you can imagine a patient has a brain tumor, mm. part of the brain is missing. And so they've had it removed. And, and so they need to have the best possible neurologic function. And that's afforded with the ketogenic diet. Remarkable. Where do you see this going in the next five years? What, what are your hopes and your dreams? Well, my hopes are that other people will come to learn the same things that I'm learning at this yes. conference and I'm teaching at this conference as well, that we don't have to kill the patient or to kill the tumor. We can treat this as a metabolic disease, which it is. So it's interesting that all gliomas uh, have a common mutation that's called an IDH1 mutation. So that stands for isocitrate dehydrogenase, and that's in the metabolic pathway. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think the fact that these tumors ca are caused by this mutation means that treating uh, a, with, a, with a concept that alters this, this mutation, meaning with a ketogenic diet, where we, we literally shift the brain metabolism and, and energy source to ketones, and those tumor cells that have the mutation, they'll die off with the, with the absence of sugar, with the absence of glucose. I've learned a lot at this conference. People are using other other concepts to treat in this metabolic way that's non-toxic. So there's a, mm -hmm. a, a diabetes drug called metformin, which helps mm -hmm. to decrease blood sugar and helps decrease sugar and the and, and decreases availability for cancer cells. And you use that again with some very simple drugs like uh, an antibiotic called doxycycline also mm -hmm. affects this pathway and the in a in the increase the NAD. Uh, the NADH ratio with a drug called oxaloacetate, um, which is really a chemical, it's a food, it's a, it's a part of this Krebs cycle right. process. And it turns out that there's really good data. It's not just a fad or some you know, crazy you know, idea that really is treating the underlying mechanism that made these tumors arise. So we're treating at the source instead of toxically killing all cells off uh, in the patient as well as the tumor, just selectively treating the tumor cells. You know, the patients really like being on the diet. That's a really interesting point. So your, your experience is that at your patients... First, yeah, at yes. first they're kind of like, oh, I don't know about this, and it's going to disrupt, oh, right. I like my carbs, that kind of thing. But when they're, you can imagine yourself, you've been yes. diagnosed with a brain tumor. Yeah. You're, you're seeing a neurosurgeon, and you're being faced with mortality. And then he tells you, oh, well, if you just change your diet, and then, so it's something they proactively do. And instead of going and getting an IV infusion of a drug or getting something that makes you feel sick and terrible, mm -hmm. you switch your diet to something that's flavorful, but you're proactively doing something every day. Every right. time you eat, you say, I'm beating this thing. I'm yes. trying. That's empowerment. Yes, and it really is something that the, that the patients are, are really gravitating to and, and holding on to. And I think not a false hope. It's a very real, real hope that it gives them something they're doing. So I... I really am involved with my patients. I'm not the kind of surgeon who just kind of operates on them and sends them back to the neuro-oncologist. I follow them for their entire lives. And so one of the things I do is I sponsor a, a activity called a DBAX in Arizona. So DBAX Race Against Cancer. Yes. So our, our patients that are being treated or cancer survivors, they run this race with me. And it's really, uh, and I got really emotional this year because I have one patient who's in a clinical trial. She's still alive. 13 years later after glioblastoma, mm. and she's living a good quality wow. of life. She raised her child all the way up to being an, an aggressive, you know, kind of a teenager now, uh -huh. trouble, troublemaker. <laughs> right? But she's loving it. She's, she's really has to kind of face like, wow, I'm alive. I wouldn't expect yeah. to be alive anymore. And, uh, and so, and other patients that are doing combinations of things that are much less toxic to them, but, but living life. Yeah. Uh, one young man is, is favorite patient. He's just got married, has a baby now. They had a honeymoon in Hawaii and he's a, you know, three and a half year survivor. He's enjoying the ketogenic diet and he's absolutely doing great. And his scans are stable as can be. And I don't think they would have been without this. So it gives us real hope. People who are so afraid of, of uh, you know, what 
is it to eat more fat? A lot of the things that we've been taught in medicine about fats are just wrong, right? You've been Can taught. Can you speak to that a little yes, bit? Yes. So yeah, you've been taught your whole life. Oh, and you'll see it in the in the advertisements. Oh, a fat-free food, all that stuff. You don't want fat-free foods. You want foods that are sugar-free, not fat-free. Yeah. So sugar is the enemy. So it's, there's a lot of things that are counterintuitive. Um, so if okay, you so sugar is the enemy, yeah. and there's this huge focus on fat-free. What, what, where's the disparity? What went wrong? Well, it turns out it's traced back to a very influential, unfortunately influential man named Ansel Keys. And he made the cover of Time Magazine. He was a physiologist, was in the Cardiology Association, and just dogmatically pushed his agenda where he really believed, I don't think he was evil, I think he believed that when you took, take out a cholesterol plaque from a coronary artery obstruction that's causing a heart attack that's full of cholesterol. And he just kind of assumed, well, cholesterol must be bad, fat must be bad. But it turns out that he was just absolutely wrong. It was based on um, a, an epidemiological study that was terribly flawed. He, he followed like 31 countries and picked out six that kind of fit his agenda, that mm -hmm. they ate kind of a low-fat diet, but they, it was very high in plants, and it turns out, you know, Japanese diet after World War II, and there were lots of problems with this study. But he neglected to understand that there were many cultures that ate a very high-fat and very low plant diet. Uh, the Inuit Indians, for example, lived terribly long lives with no heart disease, no strokes, all on whale blubber fat, yes. right? And so there's, so he completely neglected the data that didn't fit his hypothesis. That's terrible science. But unfortunately, he was very dogmatic and very influential, and he was in instrumental in developing this food pyramid, which is completely false, you know, about mm -hmm. grains right. and things, and up at the top, you know, very little meats and avoiding fats. And um, so it turns out sugar is truly the enemy. So if, you've heard, if you have a cholesterol profile or a blood lipid panel in your, in your blood test, and it has high triglycerides, everyone thinks, well, triglycerides are fats, so you should cut out your fats. It turns out the carbohydrates are what cause the high triglyceride level. Mm -hmm. And it turns out if you, if you absorb and you ingest fats, your body becomes very accustomed to using them, and then you burn the fats. Your lipid profiles actually improve when you eat a high fat diet rather than get worse. Mm -hmm. Cholesterol numbers, the HDL to LDL ratio that you want actually improves on a high fat diet rather than worse. And so your risk to stroke and heart disease actually goes down when you eat a high fat diet. It goes up if you eat sugar. So that's the message that has to get out there. Thank you so much for joining Absolutely. today. Absolutely, my pleasure.